There is a cottage industry among scripture scholars trying to figure out what the thorn in the flesh was for uh, Paul. Um, some, they look at all of his letters and they say, ah, it must be an eye problem. He has a sight problem. Other people say, no, no, no. They look through and they say, no, it's, it's, a, it's a, uh, a list or a speech problem. Or they say, no, it's depression. It's depression. So, um, and you can join this cottage industry if you want. But Paul has been dead for 1900 years and I don't think you or I are going to find a solution. And I'm glad of it. Because we don't need to know exactly what the thorn in the flesh that he was talking, the angel of Satan that beat him. I mean, this is a guy who felt oppressed by whatever it was, beaten by it. Uh, but we need to know what he did with it. Because he did exactly what you and I would do if we were, when we are afflicted, whether it's a physical ailment or a spiritual or emotional ailment, we do exactly what he did. We pray God to take it away. You do it, I do it. Paul does it. And he says that he prayed three times that this thorn in the flesh be taken away. And the answer he got from God is, my strength is sufficient for you. Uh, now, it certainly wasn't the answer he was looking for, but it's clear from the way he describes it that it became for him a hallmark of his spirituality. That is to say, that weakness made him dependent on God in such a way that God would be given the glory, not him. And for him, that was a victory. A victory he would not have had, as he tells it, unless if God had taken away that thorn in the flesh that afflicted him, that beat him down. Um, and so the invitation for us is to, is to see, I mean, any of us who are afflicted should do the first thing that Paul did. We should pray if it's cancer, if it's depression, if it's anxiety, if it's some sin we can't turn away from. And of course, we should do exactly what Paul did and pray, God, let me be released. You know, that's what I do. That's what you do. That's what Paul did. But sometimes the answer for Paul was no. My strength, God's strength is sufficient. Uh, and he'd rely on my strength, not on your glories. And that will be and sometimes that is enormously effective, the weakness of a person. Some of the, the most effective priests that I have known in my life were alcoholics, recovering alcoholics. Um, they'd gone down to the depths and they'd gotten into recovery. Uh, and they, were, they had to work their program like every alcoholic in recovery, right? But you remember the first step of AA is I, we were powerless over our and, uh, and it's what Paul says. But what happened with these particular couple I'm thinking of is that they became more compassionate through their own weakness, through their own recovery, through working their own program, than maybe they would have become if they weren't addicted to alcohol or drugs. So for me, it's always been, I think of them when I read that passage. I think, yes, it's true. Our weakness, in our weaknesses, God can bring a victory. Maybe more so than in our victories. You know, because uh, if, if someone who is weak is made strong by God, it gives everyone a role. That in our weakness, you see the weakness of someone else, and you see how God has made them strong and Paul, you say, that could happen for me. In my weakness, it make them strong. So it's really a I see what Paul means about in his weakness is his strength. Uh, because obviously, maybe everyone knew what his thorn in the flesh was. We don't, but they did. And it was obvious to them that God was using him even in his weakness. In the gospel today, Jesus faces a different problem. You, yeah, if you weren't just in the dark last week from losing your electricity and you were in church, you, you remember the passage that came immediately before the passage of today. The story of the woman with the hemorrhage 
who reached out in the crowd to touch his clothes, Jesus' and clothes, to be healed. And she was healed. And the, that's nestled in the other story of Jairus, the father of a, a 12 year old boy who was dying, and who indeed did die, and who Jesus raised from the dead. In both of those cases, and that's why if you can't go out anyway and play tennis, it's too hot. So you could read. Mark chapter 5 and then chapter 6, you know, at home, and you'll see that. Because when you put it together, what did he say to the woman with the hemorrhage? He said, Daughter, your faith has made you whole. Your faith has made you whole. Um, you know, you're reaching out, finally gave you relief. You know, and, it's, and remember that. Your faith in me, in, in God, has made you whole. The same thing with Jairus and his wife. You know, the crowd screaming, ah, oh, don't go in, she's dead as a door nail, you know, and so and so. And it is her faith that took the mother and father in with his disciples and he raised her from the dead. It's the faith of that. But here, the next passage, Jesus goes to his native place. He goes to Nazareth. And it's well attested that he had a problem with his neighbors and some of his family. Not his mother, but some of his family. Because when they said, where did he get all this? Good. Isn't he a carpenter? Didn't we know him for 30 years? We might have borrowed a saw from him. But what is this? And they took offense. Mark is mild. Luke says they were so offended that they wanted to throw him off the brow of the hill. They, they didn't want him just to leave town. They wanted him dead and out of town. I mean, this is a violent. Luke describes a very violent approach. More than just taking. And it says at the end, Jesus was amazed at their lack of faith. You know? Sometimes we can be stunned by the inertia of those who we think could come with us. Uh, you know Newton's first law is the body at rest stays at rest and the body in motion stays in motion. And the danger of being raised in the faith is that we get to the point, like Jesus' relatives, like his neighbors, uh, we say we know everything. Our life is set, we go to church on Sunday, maybe we say a rosary, we do that. That's fine. But when God begins to push the envelope with us, say, what are you doing about charity? What are you doing about forgiveness? What are you doing about uh, reaching out and telling the gospel? What are you doing about it? We say, wait a second, wait a second. I didn't sign up for this. I signed up to go to church on Sunday, and that's it. And we begin to take offense at the, at the call of the gospel, at the pull of the gospel. And I think Jesus' response would be the same. He would be amazed if we're simply standing still when he's inviting us into a deeper relationship. Amazed at our way, way, way. I didn't sign up for that. That's not that. Church on Sunday, that's it. You know, don't talk to me about how I'm supervising people. Don't talk to me about paying taxes. Don't talk to me about that. You know, that's what Jesus was doing. They knew him. They wanted it and they didn't want to move. And I'm afraid that's the other temptation. If one is to take our weakness and say, is to obsess, instead of turn that thorn in the flesh over to Christ in such a way that he can make it a strength, but it's done by God's grace, of course, like it was for Paul. The other temptation is the first law of Newtonian and Newtonian mechanics. We stay at rest. Don't tell me I need to move. Don't pull me. And if you find yourself, or I find myself in that place, welcome to Jesus' name. Welcome to the people who say, where did you get all this? Wait a second, what might you think is? Isn't he a carpenter? I didn't sign up for this. My friends, you signed up to go where the Lord calls you. And if you don't go, you're in the same position as the people in Jesus' village. We need to be like the woman with the hammer. We need to be like Jairus. 
We need to be like the centurion. You remember the story of the centurion in the Gospel of Luke, a, a Roman officer uh, who comes to Jesus on behalf of a serving boy who is sick. And uh, he says to Jesus, Jesus says, I'll come. And the centurion says, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. That's where the, the, what we say at the union. He says, I'm an officer. I tell someone do it, they do it. I say, come, they come. You say it, it's done. Jesus, Luke says, Jesus was amazed at his faith, the centurion's faith. There's a different time. A man ready to go out of his comfort zone on behalf of his serving boy to a Jewish rabbi to read the king with other called faith. So let us ask the Lord to take the thorns in our flesh and make them a strength through the Holy Spirit, but also make the Lord give us a heart willing to follow when God pushes us in our comfort zone.